and welcome to Regrader Quest, where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet and from you, the listener. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And I'm Professor Mark Sheriff, and I want to start with a public service announcement. How much of Twitter surfing have you been doing recently? Almost none. Uh, all right. All, well, all my time has been in Mass Effect Legendary Edition, and it has been well spent. I... I, I have I, I need to get back to that. But one thing that I've been seeing a bit more around Twitter just recently has been another one of these. Hey, the movie that was the number one box office 10 uh, when you were 10 years old, post that. And that's what the rest of your year is going to be like. Those sorts of things, those little quiz questions like what was your high school mascot plus your birthday? That's your rapper name. Yeah. All of those. What, what, what's your mother's those. maiden name and your social security number? Social security that's your stripper <laughs> name. <laughs> it's, don't do those folks. That is that is so bad. If you go back and look at any any sort of here are the security questions, which, by the way, security questions are so terrible for so many reasons, but we'll, that we can do that question another yeah. time. Yeah. But it's always things like, what was your high school mascot? What was your first car? What your, road did you grow up on? Your date of birth and your bank's checking account number. That's going to be your next pet's name. Post it on Twitter. Exactly. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and people might think, oh, I'm just posting it on Twitter. I'm just posting this on Facebook. Isn't this funny? No one's going to find it. Look, it's not like... You know, Q bad person Mick loser pants is intentionally going after individuals. I'm offended individuals. that you gave them the name Mick, but go ahead. <laughs> it's intentionally going through trying to find these. No, they just write a program that just scrapes everything and then matches your name with some other database of where they've guessed passwords and guessed email addresses. Just don't, folks. And and, and for the note, don't. if you think that's like an incredibly difficult thing to do, that's something we teach people to do literally in their first semester of programming at UVA is how to do web scraping. It is it is yeah. not like this big, you know, it's not just this big, uh, you know, hyper mega hacker sitting in his mom's basement drinking tab and eating cheetahs. Do they still make tab, by the way? I think they do. Okay, uh, but it, I think Mountain Dew is the Mountain Dew hardcore. Yeah, but I like Mountain Dew. Is, I like Mountain Dew, oh, okay. so I feel offended when when someone uh, uses that. Okay, yeah. uh, okay, okay. What? But I think what we're just really telling people is what we're teaching our students at mm -hmm. the university we are at is how to scam people, and that is really that's really the job that uh, we want our kids to go into. So anyway, just wanted to have a little public service announcement, folks. Don't give that information. Let's get to some questions. I think. Will, you're up first today. All right. So here it is. Um, the question is, and let me go ahead and pull it up in its entirety on my monitor, because it, it's, it's a little bit more detailed. I've been a gamer since I was eight, and I turned 40 this year. Why do the, I'm in this question, and I don't like it. <laughs> why do the bots and AI I play against today feel exactly the same as the ones I was fighting in Half-Life and StarCraft in 1998. So, well, there's this there's one computer that does all of the bots yep. and they just it's it's a it's a, you know, an old Windows 95 machine <laughs> and it's just been learning new games just like we have and it's got boomer boomer strats like old guy meek i'm the 40 year old person on this podcast not you you <laughs> you you crush all them all them bots well well so i mean let let's address first the premise of you know how how true that statement is or not um first i mean i i remember playing goldeneye 007 on the nintendo 64 and the enemies had basically one move. They had stand still and shoot at you, or they had do an unnecessary roll and then stand up and shoot at you. They didn't really take cover. Basically. They didn't maneuver around the much. They might run at you if they can't see you, but that's that's about as specific as it gets. So I, I do want to reject that notion a bit. Um, and even further, I'll say... You know, with with because I, I just played through the the Mass Effect Legendary Edition trilogy, 
The AI in Mass Effect 1 is kind of like that. It does a little bit of taking cover, but it doesn't try to flank. It doesn't try to do any advanced maneuvers. Whereas you get to Mass Effect 3, the AI actively tries to flank you and, and moves like that. So I, I, I don't know if it's entirely the same, but I will say certainly since Fear, which was a, you know, kind of a game famous for the AI where it would try to flank you and, and do various maneuvers. Um, I would say that that style has been pretty consistent, like from Fear, from Gears of War, etc. I guess, do you have any thoughts on just the premise of the question? Well, the first thing I thought of was, I don't think pathing algorithms have changed that much in this amount of time. I think no, A-Star correct. has still been around. Mm -hmm. And for those, I mean... Uh, for, for those that are not in computer science, a star is a basic algorithm that we teach students on trying to figure out the optimal path from point A to point B going potentially around obstacles uh, in, in an efficient in an efficient sort of way. I mean, there's certainly algorithms that you could use that test every single possible path. And you can't do that in a game because then, then the enemy character is standing there staring at you. That's just the way I play the game. So, um you know, I, I the, the the basic algorithms we might use might change. But the other thing to think about is that a lot of AI is not necessarily making the computer um, actually smarter. It's having these heuristics, these tricks, mm -hmm. these shortcuts that can, you know, give the illusion of some sort of behavior, of, of intelligent behavior. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, the flanking uh, uh aspect uh, that an enemy might do, we say that, you know, in this given situation, now do this. And we're, we're adding a branch effectively mm -hmm. to a little decision tree, as opposed to it's not like, I mean, yes, there are brand new, cool AI algorithms and AI researchers are awesome and doing neat and amazing stuff, but we're not necessarily putting them into the bots in, you know, half-life right? because we're trying to do some of this, you know, quickly <laughs> yeah why well, so there's actually some other things in it so i mentioned fear is kind of considered like one of the high watermarks early on in terms of like ai in a shooter type game the thing is there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in fear for example the ai will shout things like i'm moving up to flank etc that's not the ai actually communicating with other ai agents that are all acting independently it's actually all one mind and the reason it shouts those things is actually to communicate to you, the player, mm -hmm. so you can mm -hmm. react to it, and also to trick you into thinking, you know, putting up the 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 smoke and mirrors, you know, to to keep your suspension of disbelief that you're fighting against actual soldiers, you know, to keep that up. Um, but but the other thing I'll note is is getting into your your statement on heuristics. You know that there, I think it's important at this point to talk about the difference between model lists and modeled AI, just broadly. I mean, we could, we could spend a whole day talking about it, but the idea of modeled AI is that there is a programmer in a room designing what the AI system will do. That is, if these variables mm -hmm. are, are these conditions, then perform this action. Right. And, you know, the earliest chess playing computers actually did this. Um, and, you know, basically, once we had chess playing computers, it was just a matter of time before the best chess playing computers were better than the best human players. And so Deep Blue was kind of the had the big match with Gary Kasparov. It was modeled and it was really the last time a human was competitive with the top computers. Lately, what's actually been interesting in AI is model less, where you're doing things like machine learning, genetic mm -hmm. algorithms, which you can go into detail more on another podcast. But the simple point is there's no human programmer saying if X, then Y, if A, then B. Rather, the AI is effectively playing itself and learning the rules, learning effectively, for lack of a better term, intuition of how to play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is why now you can download something like Stockfish JavaScript, which is a chess playing computer that is better than you. But here's the question. In all fairness, everyone's better than me at well, chess. So. But, but no, okay, so here's here's here is a question though. And and I mean this sincerely. Do you think you would have fun playing against Stockfish for a long period of time? 
Of course not. Right, because Stockfish could absolutely beat you. And the thing about playing a game, especially a single player game, is you want to win. Right? I mean, in a multiplayer <laughs> game too, but the, the, you have to accept losing in a multiplayer game. In a single player game, you know, especially something like Mass Effect, for example, the goal is to get to the end of the story and they don't want to put up these massive, unbeatable roadblocks. They want the AI to be good enough to be challenging, but they don't want it to wipe the floor with you, which, if they had a good enough AI algorithm, it could totally do. Oh, uh, we can we we will do an entire we will we'll get into an episode on 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 game design where we talk about things like first order optimal strategies mm -hmm. where it where the basic idea is you know, um you know there there are games like a like a Street Fighter 2 where you pick a fighter where there is a first order optimal strategy a fighting maneuver like uh, e Honda's 100 hand slap basically all it requires you to do is smash a button as fast as you can yep and that will get you to a point in the game and there mm -hmm. is intentionally ai that is quote unquote dumb enough to fall for that for a certain period of time but mm -hmm. at some point a first order optimal strategy has to fail to yep. force you to learn new strategies to improve your gameplay so the ai has to change along with it mm -hmm. and so there is always a give and take between making an ai intentionally bad mm -hmm. to keep engagement of a player and then pushing it just enough to force the player to improve. So, so I, I think back to the original question, mm -hmm. it might not be that the bots are quote unquote better or worse, whatever it's, there is this intentional strategy of, we want the bot to be bad quote unquote toward the beginning so that the player can bid, build their skill so that then it can continue on and yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so, uh, for example, the, with the game The Last of Us, which also had really good AI, they said that they had to tone down the AI because at the beginning it was so strong that you people had trouble with every single firefight, which in a game mm. that is heavily story driven and it, it's meant to be a story that you see the end of frustrating players that much is going to turn a lot of them off from completing it. And and so part of that has changed from you know, in, in early NES and Super Nintendo days, etc., many games were designed such that very few people could beat them as an intentional strategy. And especially in games that are more story-driven, that's not the case because, you know, people want to know how the story ends. Uh, and, and so you can ultimately frustrate, I think, that way. I think another factor, though, is... When it comes down to it, you're going to keep using a, a model of, you know, because pretty much all game AI is modeled, not model less. Mm -hmm. There's there's very right. few machine learning algorithms in games. Um, Let's not get into that question just yet. Yeah, but but to that end, they're going, like I said, it, it's a balance. You don't want to make the AI so good that it, it makes it hard to win the game. Another right. side of it, too, is is effort. So, for example, in Civilization... Uh, in the Civilization games, the AI decision-making really doesn't change much from one difficulty to the next. It doesn't. The decisions it makes largely stay the same. The difference is, at lower difficulty levels, the AI gets fewer resources than you do. They start with less than you do in terms of oftentimes they'll only start with a settler, no warrior, on the lowest difficulty. Whereas if you get up to deity, which is the highest difficulty... Every Civ starts with, you know, one Settler and like five Warriors, and you have one Settler and one, and they get better yields than you do. And the simple reason for that is you can't make 10 different AIs that all make decisions differently, each better than the last, in a feasible time window. Right. But you can rebalance it by letting the AI quote-unquote cheat, which for the note, all AIs effectively cheat in the sense Mario that... Kart. Mario right. Kart, well, Mario oh, excuse Kart me. especially. But the thing is, <laughs> the AI also cheats to your benefit sometimes. It will slow down if it's too far ahead of you, for example, sure. um, yep. to make the game interesting. Because that's ultimately the goal, is not to make the best AI possible, but to make the best game possible. That's the goal. Yep. yep. And I, you know... Uh, Folks, if you're listening and you you're really interested in this, let us know because, um, you know, if we if we uh, should go into a deeper path, deeper dive into mm -hmm. some of these gaming questions, uh, I teach video game design. McBurney is interested yeah. in teaching video game design, and that could be fun to do. And I I do want our next. 
Oh, sorry. Before we jump to the next question, I do want to mention. Yeah, sure. People have made really good game AIs for games. Um, for example, with Dota Two, there was a famous uh, like during a World Championship tournament, they had like this really high level, well known player play a one v one against an AI, and mm-hmm. the player lost badly, really, really badly. They eventually expanded that to having five AI players, not in a one lane one video, but actually playing the whole game. So buying items, farming lanes, etc. And while it couldn't beat the top tier teams, when they had it play like on you know a ladder that is a you know just a competitive tier list, it performed in the top one percent of players in terms of mm. the, their actual win loss record. So wow. the AI was actually out in the wild playing against human opponents and beating them. And again, it was a, a team of five distinct AI that were also communicating hmm. with each other. So it wasn't one AI controlling five players. It's actually five AIs uh, communicating with each other over the internet and, 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 and reacting as such. It's also seen StarCraft AI. So the point is, eventually AI will be better at us in everything, including making fun and entertaining and interesting podcasts. And then we'll be out of the job <laughs> And we'll have to spend the rest of our lives in the pi mines calculating digits of pi for the rest of our lives. Well, okay then. That was a tra- <laughs> that was a transition. <laughs> Podcast bot will now move to next question. Here we go. <laughs> Make Podcast with the funny. Wouldn't have nope. lost this as many listeners so far. So. Oh, ouch! All right, no, we love, we love, we love, we love listeners. We love, we love folks that have. Stuck with us through all four episodes. <laughs> yeah. Well, th- three and a half. Three, three and change. So going back to my public service announcement, here's another question from No Stupid Questions subreddit. And the question is, is it true that once something gets posted on the internet, it never truly goes away? And it's an interesting way of thinking about it because um, some th- th- this question came up because the the uh, question asker might have said a few choice things on mm-hmm. Reddit in their in their younger days. Might have right. posted some pictures on Facebook in their younger days, yep. and is now trying to get a job and is now worried about what certain searches would turn up. So. Does it never truly go away? And I think there's a couple ways to think about this. First is, does is the data ever actually really removed? Mm-hmm. Or can is it just harder to find? Yeah. I think the the so so to answer the the question before we get into the implications of it, I think it very much depends. Uh, the more the more famous you are, and then famous implies like international notoriety but i mean like if you have hundreds of friends for example as opposed to a couple dozen right the the larger that pull is the less likely something is to go away i mean if you delete something and nobody has screen capped it and nobody has you know downloaded the file or somehow um in theory it can be gone Dependent, and by, by delete something, I mean you have your own website. So we're not talking like Facebook or Twitter or something. You have, say, your own website that you built from the ground up. And if you right. delete those files and nobody has screen capped it, they're gone. There's no way to know whether or not someone has done that. Yep. But, but in theory, yes, things can be deleted. But you have to worry about the Streisand effect. The Streisand effect is... When you try to get something deleted from the internet, the act of trying to get it deleted makes it more likely that the thing will be saved and seen by even more people. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's a, a, a factor that is fairly unique to the internet, right? Um, although you do actually have the Streisand effect with the uh, dating back to the Chicago Times or the Chicago Tribune, excuse me, with Dewey defeats Truman. Oh, that's interesting. That, that's so, an interesting so they, call. Yeah. So the thing about the Dewey defeats Truman paper, because uh, because I've actually seen a version at the uh, at the Truman White House in Key West, and it is actually an incredibly guarded thing because 
the, at the time, I believe it was the Tribune, um, had uh, had a had a writer stri- or had a not a writer strike, uh, a a uh, printer strike. So the printers went on strike. They weren't printing. So they they pulled people off the street to actually, like, put out the – to print the papers. And they – the people weren't smart enough to actually do it right. And so if you look at it, the headline, (laughs) Dewey defeats Truman, is kind of famous because, of course, Truman won that election. But also, like, half the paragraphs are backwards. One of them's upside down. There's, like, a bunch of – places with just egregious misspellings etc so there's a lot of problems with that paper (laughs) house of leaves on the paper itself right and so what happened was once truman won the election they went out and they tried to actually collect all the versions and they did this before sunrise they went out and collected from all the newsstands all the papers they could and threw them away but some of them got through, and one of them got into the hands of Harry Truman, who famously held up the the, the newspaper, and that drew attention to it. Um, so that kind of relates a bit to the internet, where Perhaps, yeah, if they if they made sure that they got all the papers back before anyone noticed, sure, it's possible that it's just gone to the ethos. But that's a that. That depends a lot on a luck and b uh, how how quickly you delete it. I guess. So I think that's a good way of looking at it from a sociological perspective, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. But there's also just a pure technical perspective. Yeah. So let's just take something like Facebook or right. a, a a service like a Facebook. Mm-hmm. So these services are all typically using a database model on the back end that relies on replication. And the Mm -hmm. reason that it relies on replication is when you have so many people using the service, I mean, go back to (laughs) throw back to episode three, when we talked about there's only five websites that everyone looks at kind of thing. When there's so much traffic on these websites, they need to have multiple copies of the database live at all times to handle as much traffic as go uh, that that's happening. This is why sometimes you could, I, I remember this when Facebook was relatively new, I guess, and um, you were using Facebook messenger and sometimes the messages would come in and not be in the proper order. And sometimes mm-hmm. that would happen because the databases had to resync every once in a while to ensure that they had the proper data in the proper order. Um, but it, that replication is what allows it to run quickly. And when you're building systems to scale, sometimes, depending on the system, I mean, there's a lot of depends in here, you build it for performance, and then you make sure the data is more correct is a secondary concern. If things like chat messages, you kind of want the the immediacy of it. If it's your bank account, you kind of want the correctness first. You know, there's reasons you do one as opposed to the other. So something like a Twitter or a Facebook, they are going to have redundancy, period. They're going to have redundancy. So you post something, there's a good chance it is on multiple computers very quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that if you tried to delete it, it's then eventually deleted from all of them? Yeah, perhaps. But then there's backups that are made. Then, you know, it it, it just keeps going. There's also... Throw in another... Oh, I was going to say throw in also Internet Archive. Yeah. So I don't know if that's where you're going to go next, but there is a website, Internet Ar- you know, Archive.org or the, Internet, the Wayback Machine. Mm-hmm. You can go to that website and it will store copies of websites that it will take snapshots of just periodically throughout the mm-hmm. year. So you might find a website and there will be four different snapshots of it. And I found that to be very, very useful when I want to see how a website has changed, how someone's updated their information, something like that. And it's there. Mm. I've never I've never gone to it to see if I could have something removed because it's never been a thing for me. Right. But to well, say there are there are services that troll websites intentionally to back them up. Yeah. Well, then there's also the matter of with websites like Facebook or MySpace or whatever, you know, the way they make money is whoa, through, whoa, 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 is whoa, through whoa, ads. MySpace? Stuff. MySpace. I know. Really? Right. I my <laughs> an old reference. I, I'm a, I'm a anyway. Um But with these websites, you know, except for MySpace, because they actually deleted all their old content accidentally in a migration. Like, so that stuff is actually gone. But um <laughs> but with Facebook, for example, 
they still keep your deleted like posts, for example, and they'll use that to make an information profile about you. Oh, absolutely. And so just because you delete something that makes it not visible to you or other people using the site from from the client end doesn't mean it's actually gone. Yeah, um, very good point. Yeah. You know, folks, you know, if any of our students happen to still be, you know, subscribed after four episodes, watch what you tweet, watch yeah. what you put on your Facebook page. Yep. Just you know, for your own sanity, do that. Parents, you know, sometimes you might want to watch what you post of your kids. Yeah. Yeah. So assume anyway. it will be there forever because it very well could be. So are you going to lighten the mood a little bit here, McBurney, for the um, next question? So I was going to do another gaming style question, but I actually really liked this question that I stumbled across right before mm. we went on. I actually already told Sheriff the question. Oh. And the question oh, is fret, fresh. I love it. This is, this is a, a coding question. How can okay. I create a memory leak in Java? This is actually a, a surprisingly difficult question to answer because, I mean, and well, obviously it starts with why. Why but, do you want to make a memory leak in Java? Well, it starts with what is a memory leak, right? Why is okay, Java, fair. why is it so uniquely difficult to make a memory leak in Java? And then, of course, why would you want to do that is, is a separate thing. Uh, I believe that, by the way, the, the reason why was because uh, the, the question asker was asked how to make a memory leak in Java uh, during an interview, which is a bit odd. Uh, but cause again, can, can, you, can you make our software have memory leaks? We need to make sure yeah, it's, that you can do this. Very important skill set. It's like if you're in, it's like if you're you're going for an HR position they're like so when you punch an employee in the face do you keep your fist closed or do you open it when you make contact I mean, it's <laughs> like what <laughs> why would you do this yeah um so first what is a memory leak so a memory leak is when as a program runs it effectively uses more and more memory without necessarily needing to for example for, uh, specifically Best way I could say it is um, that it's it's using it has memory allocated to the program that is no longer relevant to the program. The program will never use it again. You're OK. Uh, OK, let me just let, let me lay an analogy on you here. OK, go ahead. My seven year old has her room and she will get out her Legos and go play with them in a corner. And then the Legos stay there mm -hmm. and then she moves on to playing with her dominoes or a board game and she lets them out in another corner and she plays with it and it stays there and then she gets out her stuffed animals and she gets them out in another area of the room and and she plays with it and it stays there and eventually there's no room left and this is a memory leak yeah because the program is using a little bit of space for a bunch of different things and then it runs out of space and then it says i don't know what to do and then it crashes and then a parent trips over and steps on a lego yeah. and screams and you know it's it's the same result at the end yeah and, and specifically within that analogy it's that the floor space aka memory is being used by something that is not in use that that probably won't be used a during that run of that. men exactly and that that's that's <laughs> the that's the metaphor here so uh this can happen for example um famously one of the most famous memory leaks in games is donkey kong 64 did you know that uh, in the original Donkey Kong 64 release, that if you play the game long enough, it will always crash after X I, hours. I didn't. The more you know. No, I had no idea. Yeah. No. No matter what. So do, I, let's 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 break out some let's Nintendo 64 right trivia. So Donkey oh, Kong God. 64 was famous for being a game that required. The Nintendo 64 expansion pack. Basically, yeah. there was there was a memory card that you could access in the mm -hmm. in the Nintendo 64. It was a little lid that you could flip up on the front. And the idea was, as they improved the Nintendo 64, they wanted to be able to improve the graphics. They wanted to be able to switch out the memory. And and this came out with the expansion pack, which was a really rare niche item. Basically, it worked with like Rogue Squadron, and it actually didn't make Rogue Squadron look any better. Because uh, Rogue Squadron has a bunch of weird issues. It's, it's like famously very, very, very difficult to emulate, for example. 
but otherwise huh. didn't have a market at all, really. And then Donkey Kong 64 happened. And with Donkey Kong 64, they shipped the expansion pack. Was it because Donkey Kong 64 was just such a big, such a such an amazing looking game that if it didn't have that expansion pack, it would break? No. It was because they were getting close to the uh the deadline where they need to actually start printing the cartridges. Because, you know, this was this was it, this was in the cartridge era. It was even more than burning the disc. Certainly, this isn't like put it up on the Nintendo eShop and download it. They had to physically print, you know, thousands, millions of cartridges and, and ship them. And so mm-hmm. they had a memory leak and they couldn't figure out what it was. But because the game used the limits of the Nintendo 64 memory, basically every time you'd play for like 20 minutes, the game would run out of memory and crash. So how did they fix this problem? They shipped it with the expansion pack so it had more memory. You still had a memory leak that would eventually cause the game to crash, but you had a lot more memory that you that you didn't do you otherwise use. That was that is actually the reason for the Donkey Kong 64 expansion pack is because of a memory leak that they've never fixed. We solve the problem by buying a bigger house. Exactly. You see, you see, exactly. You solve the problem by buying a bigger room. And then, you know, when you run out of space, just use some space in the other room. Sure, eventually it's going to be a problem. But hey, that can is way down the road. <laughs> the difference was <laughs> right. you could play longer than it. So anyway, that's a memory leak. Why is it so hard to make it in Java? Well, the OK, I. Uh, gosh, I haven't taught Java in a while. Let me see if I get this right. Java has a garbage collector, Correct. which is a part of the, uh, to simplify it, it's a part of the the runtime, the, the Java runtime environment. So when you run a Java program, mm-hmm. there's actually a Java in, a executable running with the program. We'll get into right once, run anywhere another time. But it is basically the parent, and it is in charge of going back and saying, hmm, you haven't played with these Legos in like a week. So I'm going to go ahead and just put these away for you and just clear up this space. Yeah. And so, yeah, it just takes care of it. Whereas programming languages like C++, you kind of have to be much more manual about that sort of thing. Exactly. And, and so... Specifically in Java, and there, there's a bunch. The, the main way that it decides whether or not to remove uh, something is it will occasionally go through all the memory the program is using and make sure that if there's memory being referenced, that there's at least one thread of the program that has a variable oh, okay. referencing that memory. And if there's no variables uh, looking at that memory, then it releases that memory back to the computer. Now, this is actually an expensive process. So the garbage collector is a bunch of cool tiered things. For example, it will check recently allocated memory much more often, but memory that hasn't been allocated for a while, it will only check much more rarely. Uh, hmm. It's it just fa- basic optimization. So it's, it's, it's very nice. Um, but how can you get around that? Well, it turns out you can. Uh, and the answer, according to uh, Stack Overflow, because I actually didn't know this. I have no idea how to do this. Is um, you basically create a long running thread. The okay. thread loads uh, a class via something called a class loader. It allocates a very large chunk of memory, such as a, a one million size array. Stores a strong reference that is, has a variable basically pointing to that array in some static field, then stores a reference to itself in the local thread. And this causes a bunch of extra memory to be allocated. And then, yeah, like you can keep doing that, but there'd be no reason to do this except to create a memory leak. There's like, there's no practical reason for this. Like, you, no. can you do it? Sure. And, and you know, there's there's other examples, too. But you, you'd have to go out of your way to do it. And it wouldn't be. Well, yeah, it wouldn't be for any other reason. Uh, OK, yeah, that's I know. Yeah. yeah, that is that. Yeah. Now, 
Okay, let's explore again the, this was asked on an interview? I mean, I guess I could see someone trying to get at someone to say, like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe the, 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 the person being interviewed answers, well, it's hard because there's a garbage collector and I understand that this is how it works. Like, I could hope that would be the answer. Mm -hmm. I don't know what sort of devious mind on the fly says, I'm going to do whatever the heck it is you just said. I don't even think I followed it. I mean... Yeah. Well, Why? Like, I, I think it's it's useful to know how you can end up with a memory leak in C++, like how you can allocate memory C++, and then forget to free sure. But that's because natively in the language, that's something that you can do and therefore something you need to avoid doing. So, you know, how, right. how you have to know how to not do it. Java, <laughs> you have to go out of your way to do this. So that seems like a pretty weird interview question. I don't know. It does seem like, a, but it is not even close to as weird as what I've got for our final oh question. Boy. Oh, man. OK, so I ran into this one and it's not tech related at all. It just kind of popped up as I was doing random searches. And this question has haunted me. OK, so I want I want you to get your thinking cap on. You might want a calculator. Okay. Here is the question. Yes. This is also from No Stupid Questions subreddit. OK, OK. Really important to me, it's tearing my family apart. How many bees can fit in a Lexus GX? I swear to God, this isn't a joke. Hang on, I need to look at a Lexus GX first. <laughs> All right. So, so while you're looking at it, I'm going to read okay, the, the so first paragraph. Okay, so it is an SUV. I want just just for those who don't okay. know, it is a it is first it's a Lexus, so it's a luxury model, but it is very much an SUV. Okay, so I want you to take a moment and see, okay, how many bees can fit in a Lexus GX? And I'm going to read the paragraph that comes with it and see see where we're at. Okay. I brought this up during dinner two weeks ago, and it's been tearing my family apart. My mother thinks you can only fit a couple thousand. Those are terrifying bees. That's editorializing right there. That's only, <laughs> That's terrifying. My father thinks billions. My siblings think trillions. Mm-hmm. And I think... Maybe a few million at the most, a couple hundred thousand in the least. It sparked so much tension in my house, nearly two fights have broken out since, and at least one screaming match between my sister and brother. I would really like a definitive answer, so if you can provide one, please do so. Thanks. <laughs> well, so first, this is actually, I, I, I like this question because it reveals something of a glitch in, in the human brain. And, in the Matrix? Well, no, because it turns out that we exist in three dimensions, but we're really bad at thinking in three dimensions. What I mean by this is if I take a cube and I double the height, width, and length of it, mathematically I know that that increases the size of that cube by eight, by a factor of eight, two times two times two. But that's not intuitive. If you see a cube and you see a cube that has twice the dimensions, you won't necessarily instinctively say, okay, if that's one, that's eight, visually. Sure. Um, at least not instinctively. So there, there was a great video I saw by a YouTuber named uh, Tom Scott, and what he did was he showed the linear difference between a million and a billion, for example. And so... Oh, it's big. Yeah, well, and so, yeah, so the, the example he gave was he basically walked around a parking lot for one million and said, him walking that, the number of steps he took, if you took a million one dollar bills and laid them on their side, that's how far it would be. And then he drove from the outskirts of London, like all the way to the to the coast. And it was, you know, an hour and a half drive. And that distance is a billion. So so when you're talking linear, it, it it's it's mind boggling the differences. But when you get oh. to volume, it's not. It it weirdly, if anything, you have a tendency probably to underestimate. So in the thread, people actually got into this exact one. And here's another comparison of million to a billion. One million seconds is 11 and a half days. One billion seconds is 32 years. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's it's over a third of your life. So if you want to think about how much money Bezos has. <laughs> <laughs> well, but OK, so now let but, but my, my point there was. If you, like we we just the glitch in our mind is we don't translate that linear amount of number of bees well to volume. We don't instinctively do that very well. 
Because um, they're bees. Yeah. Well, so first, here's the question, too. Are we talking about making a Lexus GX-sized beehive or cabin beehive? <laughs> because at that point, you have to allocate space, you know, for... You know, all the cells, the, the honey is going to be in. No. You need like the larva bird. Or is it just like, we're just going to pack it as brim with bees and we don't we care whether they live car. or die. We are clown car shoving these suckers in. Okay. All right. It, this is jelly beans in a jar. How <laughs> many bees can you shove in a Lexus okay. Let me GX? Guess before, I'm not looking at the question right now. Good. I actually did see this question for the note. Um, did but you I, really? I didn't look at the, I didn't look at the answer for it. I just saw the question. Okay. I'm like, Oh, maybe someday, but I I don't have the sheer boldness that Professor Sheriff has to break out uh to break out a question about bees. Uh, I asked Nicholas Cage Coded about this bees. question. He said, "Not the bees." But no, um, see, I'm getting Eddie Izzard vibes. That's a well, was, that's a Wicker Man reference. It's a terrible movie. Okay. Anyway, uh, I would go with a number in the hundreds of millions. Okay, so before I give you an answer, how about we break down an algorithm? Let's just yeah. do a step by step. What would you do? So what was the first step that you would do if you were to actually try and calculate this? I would calculate the volume of the cabin and I would calculate the volume of a B. Perfect. And I think that even simple things like that is something that we should, you know, that that a lot of programming is just figuring out how you're going to solve the the mm-hmm. problem. What is the algorithm for actually figuring it out? And then you can go about making the the you know breaking the problem into smaller problems. How can we figure out the size of a Lexus GX interior? Well, you probably go to Lexus's website. It probably has like the interior is this many cubic feet. In matter I, I of fact, be- it does rate. have that. I have a better way because you have well, to you have to count for seats. For example, bees can't be in the seats, right? I'm assuming we're leaving the seats in. So we fill Lexus GX cabin with water, and then we slowly trickle it out into a very, very big graduated cylinder. And that oh, is our okay. volume. So it's a, <laughs> then, we, then we put it in a big Archimedes tub, type and you see approach. how much it... There yeah. you go. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's the question of exactly what type of bee are we using? Are we using a standard honeybee? Are we using more of a carpenter bee? Those suckers are large. What about a death but, hornet? Well, let's That's not, not really a bee. Okay. So it turns out it was calculated for two different types of bees. Okay. Okay. Um, For your standard honeybee, uh, first off, the interior space of a Lexus GX is 141.3 cubic feet. Okay. The volume of a standard, normal, good old honeybee is 0.3 cubic centimeters. Okay. Conversion, yada, yada, yada. Uh... This intrepid user, Jill and her hills, came up with 6,351,111 bees. So I was off by two what, orders of magnitude, my guess. Well, you still did better than the, the people who said billions. Yeah. Or I, thousands, for that matter. No. Yeah. And it also turns out there is a type of really tiny honeybee uh, called a per, peridita minima which sounds small because yeah. it's minima. And this one is 955,209,177. Okay. So I'll say I was right just on that ground. And I'll say that I'm <laughs> terrified of any Lexus filled with bees. Yeah. That, that doesn't seem like it, if your Uber driver pulls up, <laughs> and, and they're just like, yeah, just find some space in the back. Just, just push them out of the way. I am canceling that ride. We're heading to HoneyCon 2021, and I've got a whole bunch of that bees would, here. That would at least be the fourth worst Uber ride I've ever had. <laughs> oh, man. I love the internet. Can I interest you in everything all of the time? Yeah, indeed. That is that's just going to keep coming on and on and on. Oh, my goodness. Well, folks, thank you so much for hanging out with us once again. We're having fun. We hope you're having fun, too. We thank everyone for listening. Hope that you have subscribed on your podcast 
application of your choice, you can go to regraderequest.com to find links to the show on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, or you can listen to it right there on Anchor FM. And also, when you go to regraderequest.com, you will find a button to record an audio message. And if you have a question that you think needs a second look, send it to us. And McBurney and I would love to listen. We'll play it on the show, assuming it's suitable to be played on the show. Remember, we are trying to avoid the explicit tag. (laughs) And um, we would love to take a second look. So... For myself and for McBurney, you can find me at Mark Sheriff. You can find him at Prof McBurney on Twitter. And remember, watch for falling watch, goats. Watch for falling goats. Take care. Maybe everyone. the bees. Maybe the bees will catch it on the way down. Yeah. How many bees does it take to catch a fall?